I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about China's future access to artificial intelligence, we have with us Greg Allen, who's director of the AI Governance Project at CSIS, kind of like the Ohio State University. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So you put out a really impressive and important report just a couple weeks ago. It was on the heels of the Biden administration's decision on new export controls policy on AI and semiconductor technologies with regard to China, which was announced on October 7th. This is, this is something that you've called a, a landmark in U.S.-China relations. Can you explain to me why that is? Sure. Well, grand historical inflection points rarely take the form of 139 pages of bureaucratic jargon, but sometimes they do. And this was one of those moments where the Department of Commerce put out new regulations on exports of AI technology and semiconductor technology to China. And that in and of itself is a big deal because those two industries are a big deal, which I'm sure we'll talk more about later. But perhaps the biggest thing of all is it was a major reversal of the entire U.S. approach to technology and trade for China, which has been in place now for more than two decades. There's sort of two things that I would highlight in that regard. The first is when it comes to selling technology to China, the sort of overarching approach has been, yes, we will uh, sell technology to China, but generally not the state of the art stuff. So China's technological progress is allowed to advance, but the United States is still kept ahead. Well, we, with this, we're not merely trying to restrain China's technological progress. We are trying to reverse it. There are advanced Chinese companies in China that this policy is designed to put out of business. And that's just a big overarching policy change. The second area where this policy is a major reversal is in terms of the approach of who we can sell to in China. Historically, U.S. trade with China has been restricted on a no military end use and no military end user basis. But this new policy dramatically expands to a lot of new technologies, a no China policy. For the most advanced AI chips that power the most advanced AI algorithms, you just can't sell them to China at all. And that's a big, big change. So if I have this right, this is a really big deal because what we're doing is we're choking off China's ability to do very advanced things with semiconductors that they can't produce themselves. Am I right about that? Exactly. The nature of this is that both the United States senior leadership and China's senior leadership believe that leadership in artificial intelligence technology is foundational to the future of military power and economic competitiveness. And actually, both the United States and China are already global leaders when it comes to AI technology, both in the fundamental research parts of artificial intelligence, but also commercialization and industrialization of AI technology. The U.S. and China are very, very strong. But AI includes both a software dimension and a hardware dimension. And in the case of AI, they're really great at the software dimension. They are really good at running very large-scale data centers that train really advanced AI models and turning that into products like TikTok that consumers actually want to use, all of which includes a lot of AI when you look under the hood. That's on the software side of the equation. But on the hardware side of the equation, if you open up those data centers and you look inside what types of computer chips are powering those AI algorithms, they're almost invariably American-designed, American-made chips. And so there's a big divergence in China's ecosystem between their capabilities in AI software and their capabilities in the semiconductor hardware that powers all of that. And this policy restricts the sale of those AI chips, those chips that are specialized for running AI algorithms, and that is literally designed to choke off China's access to the future of AI technology. Yeah, you famously said and quoted uh, by a columnist in the New York Times that it's not just intended to choke off, but it's intended to actually strangle China. So this is really aggressive. Yes, as I said, there are a lot of companies in China right now who are the darlings of Chinese media, who are the darlings of the Chinese government, because they're really good at what they do. But what they do 
is be part of a value chain in which the United States is a critical supplier of technology. And because of China's policy of military civil fusion, which is designed to deeply and often covertly interweave China's military sector and commercial sector, the United States has now said, we understand that there are some commercial businesses in China who are sort of legitimate commercial entities, but China has so successfully evaded our no military end use policy that we have no option but to restrict the sales of this technology to all of China. So all of those Chinese tech darlings in chip design or in semiconductor manufacturing, many of them are going to go out of business because of this policy. So this is what this means is is a company in China that does social media or does language processing or or design or anything like that in the past we would sell them the technology but the problem with that is is that companies in China are allied with with the Chinese government of course which is of course allied with the people's liberation army so it's all fused into one and we're saying we can no longer give it to any of you because you're all the same thing Right. And again, those links are sometimes in the open and sometimes they are very deliberately hidden, part of the policy of the Chinese government. But if you go to a leading AI research conference, something like NeurIPS or CBPR, you know, this is where the best AI researchers in the world get together to share the fruits of their research. And there's a ton of Chinese individuals there represented because they do great research. You'll see companies like iFlyTech, which is very strong in speech recognition and language processing. You'll see companies like SenseTime, uh, which is very strong in computer vision and uh, AI for analyzing video and imagery. But those companies, their biggest customer is the MSS, the domestic security services in China that are responsible for the human rights atrocities in Xinjiang, that are responsible for the crushing of uh, Hong Kong. These are the ways in which AI technology is used in China. And it's big business in China. And that business is the fusion of their military and security sector. And they're very successful at times, commercial companies. And the United States here is putting a stop to it. So we're not just worried about them developing advanced weapons. We're worried about them continuing to improve their technology, where their surveillance technology, for instance, where they just keep track of where everybody is in China at all times, and maybe they export that around the world. Well, the official finding of the U.S. government at this point, and this is true in both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, is that the human rights atrocities in Xinjiang constituted genocide. And there was an amazing uh, New York Times piece on this uh, a couple years ago that's called How to Turn a City into a Prison. And it was based on an investigative reporter spending a lot of time in Xinjiang. And the number of cameras that you see on every single street corner is almost unfathomable. And behind all of those cameras is not some human watching it. It's AI algorithms watching it and automatically tracking people based on their ethnic features, automatically tracking people and connecting that to all the other data that they collect on all of their life. And so the United States has sort of said, do we really want this AI-enabled authoritarian repression to be deployed at scale using our technology? And the answer is no. I should point out, though, that the primary justification in this specific Department of Commerce policy was military in nature. As I said before, the People's Liberation Army has talked extensively how they believe that AI is the next military revolution, just as significant as the original invention of computers, which try and find me a military technology more sophisticated than a bullet that doesn't involve computers in some way, shape, or form. That's how big a deal they think this is. And frankly, the United States military agrees. And so we've said, we agree this is the next revolution in military technology, and we are not going to allow our companies to help you get there. So Greg, you're a former director of AI policy at the Defense Department. And so you've worked deeply in this nexus between national security and technology. Is this really something we need to be scared of? from China that we share technology or that they are able to somehow achieve similar type of capabilities that we have? Yes, absolutely. I I would say when it comes to the adoption of artificial intelligence technology, the Chinese military is racing ahead at a really remarkable pace. 
I had the opportunity to travel to China before I entered the Defense Department because some of my academic work got me invited to conferences where military scholars of different countries engage and try and have a precursor to diplomatic talks at the academic level. Well, at that point, one of the folks who was speaking on a panel next to me was a senior executive at a Chinese weapons company. And he said, AI is the future of military technology. In future wars, there will be no people fighting. There will just be AI-enabled military robots. Clone and wars. The, yes, and well, not clone wars, robot wars. Robot right? wars. But then the most remarkable thing he said of all, and this is the future my company is working to build. That is what he said. It's really remarkable how all in the Chinese government is on this. And then I would point you towards the war in Ukraine, where we are already seeing artificial intelligence make a really incredible difference on the battlefield. I'll highlight just one area, which is in the analysis of drone imagery. There was a team of volunteer technologists, people who used to work in Ukraine's tech industry, but are now volunteering to support the Ukrainian military. And they had taken commercial drones, which at this point, Ukraine is fielding commercial drones in really large quantities for the airborne intelligence that you can get in order to target artillery or do other types of things. And in this case, they were collecting so much commercial drone imagery, it was sort of more than their number of human analysts could plausibly keep track of. And so what these volunteer technologists did is they put an AI model on board that drone that could detect tanks that were hiding in forested areas. So if you take a pair of human eyes and you look at like a, an airborne image of a large forested region, where is the tank in this forest is a really hard task for a human analyst, especially if they're looking at 100 drone feeds simultaneously. But this AI algorithm can do that almost instantaneously. And that's just one small application application, but it only took them two weeks to make that application. That's how fast you can actually deploy new military relevant capabilities if you have the right human capital who knows how to build AI stuff, and if you have the right technology infrastructure to deploy AI stuff. And that is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how AI is already making an impact on the war in Ukraine. And this technology is not going to stop. We still have many decades ahead of us of exponential technological growth. Many people see what we've just done with this regulation to be ratcheting up the tension between the United States and China. And in the past several weeks, we've seen Xi Jinping speak at the 20th Party Congress in China, where he said that we're, China is now in a new era that he's leading that is going to be dominated by technology and military defense. And I guess the question that I have is, where does the ratcheting up between us and China stop? And is this something that keeps U.S. policymakers and critical staff up at night? Well, I think it's fair to say that this represents a ratcheting up. I think that's just unambiguously true. I would point you to the speech of Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who said on October 17th, 10 days after this policy came out, quote, we are at an inflection point. The post-Cold War era is over. At the heart of this new competition is technology. So saying the post-Cold War era is over is not quite saying that we're in a new Cold War, but it's also not that far off. Yeah. He really is saying that we are at this historical turning point, and that comes on the heel of announcing this massive new change in overall China policy based on a change in our China technology policy. Okay, so we now have this new policy. Are we capable of actually enforcing it? Oh, my favorite question, honestly. <laughs> I think just in general, all of D.C. is so excited about should we export control this? Should we export control that? And nowhere near enough people are spending enough time and asking, do export controls work? What percentage of the time do they work? How expensive is it to enforce export controls? How expensive is it to circumvent and evade export controls? The reality is that if you look at the U.S. response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the amount of new types of goods and technologies and services that were export controlled, that is a long, long list. It is a list that is designed to absolutely crush the Russian economy. 
So imagine what the budget for export control evasion in Russia is doing, right? It's critical to the survival of their economy. It's critical to the function of their war machine. Of course, they are going to pay any price to evade these export controls. Similarly, in this case of China, we are literally taking their number one technology priority in the five-year plan, AI modernization, and saying, we are going to stop you from achieving your goal, and we are going to stop you from achieving it using export controls. So what do you think the budget for export control evasion in China is going to do after this policy? Well, it's not going to go down, right? So I think about the poor, poor people in the Department of Commerce Bureau of Industry and Security who are in charge of implementing this policy as well as the export controls package for the Russia sanctions. Their to-do list has exploded over the past year. What has their budget done? I mean, it's gone up, and you might hope it's going up for this, but actually it's going up because of the last round of stuff that Congress ordered them to suddenly get good at. Now BIS is responsible for policing imports of Huawei technology. So the actual budget for the core BIS function of export controls enforcement, that's flat, potentially even declining once you take into account inflation. These people need help. Congress needs to act. Dare I ask how many people work in that bureau? Overall export control enforcement, in terms of like the number of export control officers, the number of analysts who are supporting this, we're talking like low hundreds of people, like maybe 200 officers who are responsible for you know, policing the hundreds of billions of dollars of economic activity and sensitive technologies. So they're walking around with their hair on fire every day. Every day, their to-do list is growing by far, far more than they are getting done every day. I mean, they need more staff, they need more technology, they need more budgets. This is an agency that Congress has sort of been neglecting for well over a decade that suddenly everybody has discovered is at the center of national security. And it's time to start taking care of them like the actual precious resource they are. It's pretty amazing when we discover something like that within the government that is so important, isn't it? I mean, it is. I, I've talked to export control officers who have been targeted for retaliation by the Russian FSB. I mean, these are people who are genuinely putting their lives on the line in U.S. national security, and a lot of people have never even heard of them. They don't even know they exist. Right. These are people who live in Montgomery County in Northern Virginia and just go to work every day and try to do their best in public service. Well, they actually have an, they actually have an international arm, right? So these are people who are trying to identify organized criminal networks that work on behalf of foreign intelligence agencies. And trying to get inside foreign organized crime agencies is not the easiest or safest task in the world. A lot of what BIS does is site inspections, but they do an awful lot of a lot of different types of work, and almost all of it is important, and almost all of it is understaffed and under-resourced. Really a lot to think about there. Greg, let me ask you, how do we think China retaliates against this? So I think there's been a lot of said on, on this topic, and I would say that some people say that China will not retaliate. I don't really think that's credible. I think that ultimately pride is on the line in this matter, and if you look at the way that this action is being termed, both by Chinese government officials and in the Chinese media, in the conversation between the Chinese foreign minister and the U.S. Secretary of State, the Chinese foreign minister described this as a policy of containment, once again, hearkening back to the U.S. strategy in the Cold War. And I don't think that that's the sort of thing that China is just going to take lying down. However, if you look at what the options available to China are in terms of how to retaliate, there's not a lot of attractive targets. China could put tariffs on a host of U.S. goods, but that would probably hurt China more than it would hurt the United States. The reason why the White House National Security Council and the Department of Commerce felt comfortable taking this action is because it was an asymmetric amount of pain. We could do a lot to limit the growth potential of the Chinese military while undertaking a comparatively modest amount of pain upon U.S. commercial industry. If you ask where does China have sort of equivalent options for hurting the United States, there's not a ton. And China also has to ask itself, in terms of what types of ways it might retaliate, how is that going to be perceived by U.S. allies, right? 
Right now, the United States is trying to go around and persuade a lot of its allies to adopt equivalent export controls because there are other countries that are in the game in this field of AI and semiconductor technology. Sure, the Dutch, for instance. The Dutch are very strong in lithography. The, the Japanese are strong in a, in a different segment of semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And these are countries that the United States is trying to persuade, hey, you should also have a version of these export controls that we just adopted. Well, if China goes around massively restricting rare earth metals, for example, which is one of the options commonly discussed as a tool in their toolbox. I was thinking medical ingredients, too. Yeah. How do you think the Dutch and the Japanese are going to react to something like that? That's going to make them realize, okay, perhaps China is a really unreliable supplier. Perhaps China really is a national security threat. And so China's options, I don't think, are that attractive. Even though they're not that attractive, I don't imagine that they can possibly avoid retaliating in some way. Another option available to them that has been used in the not-too-distant past in a trade dispute between South Korea and Japan is organizing boycotts. So I could imagine, for example, that a host of U.S. consumer brands, which are mostly unrelated, right, to the, the question of AI and semiconductors, you could imagine that the Chinese government would organize boycotts of these brands just trying to inflict generalized economic pain upon the United States. I don't know how effective that's going to be, but I'm, I'm sure it's the type of thing on their should we do this list. Greg, finally, there's those who say that this could actually be good for the Chinese in the long run because it could strengthen their ability internally to domestically produce semiconductors, chips, and so forth. What do you think about that? Well, I think that was a lot more credible before October 7th than it was after October 7th. This policy, rather confusingly, had one part of it that was disclosed in September related to the chip restrictions, and then the, the following restrictions, which included stuff on restricting chip design software, chip manufacturing equipment, and the components that go into chip manufacturing equipment. The fact that all of those additional export control hooks were included dramatically increased the ease of enforcing this policy and dramatically make it much more difficult for domestic Chinese champions to replace what America has taken away. The basic point is, if you want to build an airplane, right, you don't just need an engine. You also need a jet, you need a jet engine, you need flight computers, you need wings, you need landing gear. And the reason why I bring this up is the number of things that China must simultaneously develop a competency domestically in is a really long list. That is why this export controls package, which was aimed at China's AI sector, but includes a lot of interlocking functions in the semiconductor industry as a cohesive whole, it's actually a very, very strong use of US technology leverage in key choke points in this industries. And it will be quite tough for China to get out of. That's why I think China's move in this regard is really going to be focused on US allies and trying to pressure them who are strong technologically in a lot of these areas to help China escape. And that's why if you talk to the Undersecretary of Commerce and you ask him what he's doing today, he says, I'm on the phone. I'm on the phone with my counterparts in the Netherlands. I'm on the phone with my counterparts in Japan. These export controls really need to be made multilateral very, very soon. And that's one of the top priorities in U.S. national security right now. Well, Greg, thank you very much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 